Hello and welcome back to the Fund Your Passion podcast with me, Amanda Stretton, ably assisted by my beautiful sidekick here, Darren Selig. Hello. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm, beautiful. I'm finding Thank you. new superlatives with which to describe you. Well, keep... but that's also because I'm buying a new car. You so, are. Yeah. I think we're funding it. Yeah, I think you are. Um, <laughs> but keep them coming. I'm, keep, them... <laughs> keep them coming. I'll take beautiful today. All right. Great stuff. Um, and of course, the even more beautiful Merlin <laughs> Cormac from Duke of London. Hi, Merlin. Hello. How are you both? Hello, Good. Merlin. And thanks for hosting us You're today. most welcome. Thanks for coming down. Now, Merlin, I've wanted to come here for a long time, heard a lot about it, never quite got here. But for people <laughs> who don't know, explain, what is Duke of London? It's difficult to put into terms, but it's essentially it's a car dealership uh, that's multifaceted. So we also do car storage, car restoration. Uh, it's kind of a family element to it. My brother and father both have restoration businesses based on site. We've got a pub on site that my mum runs. Uh, we've also got a pizzeria, coffee shop, uh, Tex-Mex restaurant, wine bar. Space is used for events. Uh, everything up here that you see is for sale, including all the automobilia on the walls. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a car dealership that's growing on arms, arms and legs. absolutely no reason to go home. I mean, there's <laughs> no, a hotel in no, here my, somewhere my, my as well. My missus hates it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a real lockdown kind of passion project because yeah, everyone was kind of bored, sat at home. We were with that, the sales were flying because I think people had a bit more disposable income, yeah. a bit more time in their hands. Uh, so a, as we sort of manifest our way through lockdown from a sales perspective, I decided to add a few more elements to it. Um, we've now got about 50 independent businesses based from under this, uh, this roof, as it were, um, all kind of local small creative businesses, both hospitality, retail, and kind of more artisty, um, cooperative things as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot more to it than just it being a car so dealership. It's a real local community feel about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've been very, very lucky. It's been a real collaborative effort yeah. to get it to where it is now. It, it wouldn't be half what it is if it wasn't for the other businesses and people that we have on site. And uh, you talk about your, your family being involved as well. Obviously, your dad was quite heavily involved in cars yeah. and the sort of car industry. Is that where your interest was originally peaked? Yeah, without question. So dad's got a restoration business, has had that my entire life. And so obviously growing up around that, spending the school holidays, sweeping the floors and making a mess in his workshop and things kind of got us onto this uh, automotive path from quite a young age. Mum always had sort of weird and interesting cars too. So we, we were always that kind of odd family at school that had classic cars. <laughs> um, and yeah, it sort of snowballed from there. Dad, dad's never really done um, yeah, proper sales outfit or anything he's very much focused on the restoration stuff so at working alongside him saw a bit of an opportunity to take advantage of you know and his so reputation what and stopped you from sort of just following that path and doing just restoration to yeah. sort of moving into this much more lifestyle sort of wider aspect I think of it. it just uh, to be honest that my brother and my father are very 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 good at what they do I'm not as good at it <laughs> to be blunt. and um, yeah I started buying and selling cars when I was at school and I think I just sort of found my passion and carried on from there. You've definitely sort of tapped into the whole sort of visual thing. It's about, I mean, it's, it's about the sort of lifestyle. It's got a great vibe. For, well, thank you. Do you want me to explain that? Or do you know what I mean right. by that? Yeah. Um, you, I'm 54, I do know you what I mean. But I, uh, I did have a little walk around and the memorabilia is amazing. And I had this weird notion in my head, like if you just boxed it all up, because it's so spread out, it's, it's actually a huge amount of stuff that you've got here yeah we're quite lucky um, we, work, we work with a guy called Dino who supplies and runs them Dino the, yeah <laughs> I know you couldn't make it up um, who runs all the automobilia and he, he has got he reckons this is about 10% of his whole collection but he everything again everything that is in here is up for sale and um, it's forever rotating with mm. that and we're trying to keep it fresh but one of the things I've been really keen on doing without it becoming sort of faux is every time someone comes here I want it to feel like something's changed almost in like a department store-esque yeah. way it's something new something different and you know, something new to look at and whatever else so. now you've obviously sold some fantastic cars and you've got some pretty special stuff here as well which I'm quite looking forward to having a look at um, but has there been anything that's been really memorable or really stood out yeah I mean to be honest we've been really lucky over the years we've handled the sale of about 500 cars over the last 10 years so it's it's tricky to pick a favorite um, I think it's it, where this is now um, you know grown to the, to the scale it is now it's really tricky it's like running a puppy farm it's so difficult to choose what we hang on to and what we sell I'm so guilty of you know, buying something given for stock and then saying actually you know this this, this could work is it? yeah that is a typical running theme with most um, dealers who yeah. are enthusiasts and actually yeah, quite. a passion for cars. Yeah. Not, not every dealer has a passion for cars. No, so, no it, it, I know what you mean. Yeah, because yeah, it, it's, it's really been instilled in my blood, so I'm really... Now, uh, Amanda has a nice Camaro. 
Yes, I know the car. I know. Yeah. 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 Are you interested? You know? <laughs> we'll have a chat. We'll have a chat. <laughs> this shell, I mean, you could do a swap on this Shelby, which yeah, is quite beautiful. But I don't want, I don't, beautiful. I mean, I do like it, but I'm, I'm, you, know, I'm, you know what I've got. Yes. Yes. So. Yeah, I think that's a step up. It is, yeah. I think so. I, I like it. But anyway, yeah. um, so you're talking about sort of being quite discerning about the cars that you keep, the cars that you hang on to. Do you apply that same rationale to the businesses that you partner with on site? Absolutely, yeah. It's, we're really, uh, you know, obviously we, we, we're not draconian about it, but we, we really do want to make sure that everything that does join the ship, as it were, is complementary. Uh, and I think we've been really, really organically lucky with who and what has turned up and who we've worked with. It hasn't worked with everyone, to be mm -hmm. blunt, but we've, we've run at 95% occupancy for the last five years since we've been in this building. So we've, we've, the demand is there for the spaces that we've curated. Um, but it's, it's really just been about more, more for us about the types of people and businesses that we've got in here. We're really, really lucky to have what we've got. And what about the sort of events that you run here as well? Because I know yeah. last night was a biggie. Yeah, yeah, we had Mercedes night last night. It, it sort of, you know, classic case of it, it had sold out, but still another 20 cars decided to turn up unannounced, which is fun. It's like, where the hell do we put them? Um, but yeah, we run, uh, we've got a schedule of sort of monthly rolling events. We do an event called Classics and Cake on the third Sunday of every month. Again, all, all of it goes to charity, so we, we charge people a tenner to come along in their car and raise a lot of money for a really awesome local charity. Um, and then we do the Mercedes nights, American nights, you can get the Camaro out to, Italian nights, and uh, away from the car meets, we also host sort of big party nights downstairs in the wine bar, with DJs on live music, and food nights, and supper clubs, and all sorts of stuff, yeah. And what's the average age of someone that turns up to these events, or is it it's just It's so notes? varied, yeah, yeah we, we're, we're quite, fortunate that we've got everything from like real young car enthusiasts. I'm just wondering whether I'd fit in. <laughs> you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether it's you, all kind of your kind age. Up age. A bit, but you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's everyone from kind of you know, young enthusiasts with their you know, yeah. car sponsors with their cameras and all the way up to sort of collectors who are old enough to be my grandparents and stuff. It's, yeah. it's really, and, but there's no pretense. It doesn't matter whether you turn up in, you know, yeah, whatever, a million pound car or a 50, 50 and The common theme is cars. enthusiasts love a car. Precisely. And yeah. there isn't actually that much in this part of London either. No. Um, so the area itself being massively developed, this building is going to be consumed by the uh, neighbouring development. And uh, um, unfortunately, you know, we knew we were only here for a certain amount of years. We've been here a lot longer than we thought we would. COVID and everything else really delayed their development of this site. But we've just agreed and secured a new site within this development on a 10-year you know, deal. So we'll have some permanence here. And I think we've really found ourselves as becoming a proper Brentford business. And we're really loath to let go of that. But around here, beyond this, there's nothing really for, no. from an automotive perspective. And so we've, we've been, uh, it's, it's fulfilled a void. And we, we took advantage of a bit of a vacuum where there's so many people around here with cool cars, interesting cars, or a passion for it. And uh, yeah, I think as well, having the subsidiary businesses like the pizza restaurant or whatever else, doesn't matter also if you are into cars or not. Um, we've got a lot of customers whose wives may not be as enticed by the cars, but they're still very happy to come and hang out here because, yeah, again, visually and whatever else, it's, it's still it's catering a, for them. It's a fun place yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've really tried hard to make it not a man cave car hub sort of thing, yeah. Um, can you tell us more about where you're going? Yeah, ish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're about to sign on the dotted line. So uh, it's about 500 metres away, similar scale to the unit we're in at the moment and um, it's right on the river. It's going to be really, really cool. Um, we, we've got uh, Mother Haas doing the design, interior design of it, and she's come up with an amazing scheme for it. So I'm really oh, she's quite nifty at that. Yeah, she's quite good at that. Yeah. Sandy. <laughs> I just get told what I'm doing, but it's yeah. good. Yeah. See, he's got it. He, he's learned the rules of the game there. Yeah. Doing as he's told. Well, well my yeah. wife's a divorce lawyer. She, she can't really help me. No. Yeah, you're, you're, you're screwed. Otherwise, yeah. I'm absolutely... <laughs> Funnily enough, a lot of people say that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not true. Um, but does the new site afford you any other opportunities that you yeah. are yet to explore? Yeah, so there's, um, fr from the events perspective, there's a lot more that we can do there. Um, I don't want to tell too much, but it will be, uh, from a volume sort of aspect, we'll be able to house more by way of events and have multiple things running at the same time. We're quite restricted where we are here. We've got the forecourt out the front where we can, on a, on a good day, we can squeeze mm. door to door about 60 cars out there. We can probably do three times that in the new space. Um, so it'll really hopefully up the ante with that as well. So I think the whole event um, concept with cars and uh, enthusiasts, it's just been on an exponential rise in growth over the last 10, yeah. 20 years. I mean, is, do you think that's becoming saturated at all now? There's so many I think, I think it depends. events now. It depends on how you look at it, but I, I still think we're quite lucky in as much as we've got something for everyone. So it, yeah. you know, 
where Caffeine and Machine have soared, it very much caters for that market. Great, yeah. the Ace Caff up the road, again, same thing, they've got their target audience. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I think the fact that they're all busy, we're busy, it just, it kind of proves that there is you know, still a demand for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there, it's, I think it's great. I don't think, it, it, there's no real competition either. It's it, the more the merrier, frankly. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, obviously, Supercar Driver have events yeah. constantly around, around uh, the, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how many, but it's literally constant. Nearly every weekend, different dealers, meetups, events, and it's it's like this insatiable appetite. There's, they're all very well attended, yeah. and um, you know that's that's a massive change from when I were allowed up in Newcastle. <laughs> and uh, you know, there was there was no such things. Yeah. As no. Yeah. But do you think also it helps? I mean, obviously, because the the principal business is selling cars. Um, do you think it helps? sort of um, when there's a community and there's activities and there is this whole sort of lifestyle around the cars yeah. as well does that help with car sales yeah definitely it was, it was, it was never um, I don't say it was almost the concept of it was a sort of a, it wasn't a lost leader or anything we really did just want to host stuff but off yeah. the back of it we have we've, we've built amazing relationships with you know, customers old and new off the back of our events and they, they're all very keen to bring their friends and sort of you know, show off what they've bought or what they're selling or whatever and, yeah, it really does. Yeah, in, in a very soft sell way, mm -hmm. um, we we never get people here and yeah, force them to walk around the show or anything. It's it's all very yeah, take your time, do what you want. I think on, on yeah, we've taken advantage of that approach, and people do come down to the events and drive away in a car, which is quite nice. So as well as being very visual in the physical, you're also quite active on social as well with the stuff that you do and the content that you create. How important is social media? I think a lot of the that say success of what we've done has been quite heavily reliant on that. And we do a lot of business off the back of social media as well. Um, so we sell an awful lot of cars off the back of this, or could sign or well, buy or whatever, a lot of cars off the back of social media. So uh, yeah, it's, it's hugely valuable to us. Um, we've really kind of, I think we were amongst some of the first younger generations who were taking advantage of this you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Now all the dealerships have got big, big followings and big pages mm. and good luck to them. It's, I think it's great. It's, it's a, it was for a long time a kind of untapped resource, but yeah, great. I think it's, yeah, we, 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 we would, uh, we'd miss it if it wasn't there. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, it must have, you must have seen a change as well, certainly in the people that you work with, how they're using social to really sort of drive business. It's and been a total game changer for a lot of them. Uh, so in, in terms of uh, luxury and high performance car dealers, some of the cars that they're buying in don't even get into the showroom. No. They're, they're sold on, on Instagram, Instagram yeah. um, and other uh, platforms before they've even had a chance to, yeah. to put it up for sale, which is it pretty incredible yeah. uh, if, I, you, if you think about it. So it still blows my mind. They, it blows my mind, yeah. literally. I'm not batting uh, you away, there's a fly that's buzzing around. It's I all right, you think I'm clear. beautiful, yeah, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm fine with, <laughs> with that. So, so uh, and, and obviously you're seeing a, a huge, huge increase of um, sale and auction platforms. Yeah. So dealers and private individuals put their cars for sale on auction platforms mm. and classifieds. And all. Uh, it's yeah, it's totally changed the landscape. So there is a question over these large franchise groups who have gin palace um, showrooms and huge amounts of money invested in real estate and branding. You know what? It, what is the future of that? Mm. Uh, given the amount of cars that are sold, and you know when I say um, that p things are sold on auction platforms, the independent dealers, it's the same for for franchise groups. They're selling huge amounts of cars just online. Yeah. Um, and buy photographs and first time someone sees it is when they turn up to collect it. If they actually even turn up, it might yeah. be yeah. Um, delivered. So massive change, massive change. Yeah, over the last couple of years, we've really made a, a staunch effort to just document everything that comes into the nth degree. So we, we always have this, like we've got like a digital pack. So each of the cars now, more, more than we ever have before, we'll have a couple of hundred images of the car, five minutes worth of video footage of it yeah. from the outside, inside, underneath everything, get it up on the ramp all the paperwork scanned and in a document so we yeah. can then just so you got send all the provenance of the car exactly. so all there we, people know what they're buying yeah it's, it vets so many yeah. tire kickers which as actually well. which is why i really love the concept of what you've done here because if, if a lot of people are moving online buying online as a trusted source then what do you do with the real estate space yeah. Yeah. because the showrooms are largely empty yeah. so it's very nice that that you have a community spirit here where, where there's events and things yeah. going on. I think that, that's a really good use of space. Yeah, I'd be, yeah. I'd be loath to just take in a sort of shed in an industrial estate that wasn't public facing. I think it was yeah. part of the charm of, of certainly this place and other places similar to it is that people get to come and experience stuff. And we don't really care if they're coming here to buy a car or a coffee. It doesn't matter to us. We just want people through the door and yeah. share, share what we're doing. Yeah. 
Um, so let's talk about some of the cars that you've got here at the moment. Yeah. Say, I'm looking forward to having a bit of a run through, but are there any particular... <laughs> that is a really annoying fly. Um, are there any um, yeah. sort of standouts? I mean, I can think of one in particular, but there we go. Yeah, I mean, we, we've got some varied stuff and we always, uh, I, I try to like, you know, tailor and curate what, we, what we've got in here to all budgets and sort of, uh, interests. So um, you know, the Mercedes SL over there, the purple car, we'll go, I'm sure we'll get around to in a, in a while. It's just the most insane specification we've ever seen on one. Um, they're quite desirable, these R129s now, but this car is, does he know this, does he know this, does he know this, does he know this? I would love to have met whoever ordered that car knew, because the, the, the spec list on it is exhaustive uh, and really low miles, low They're ownership. They're probably just lazy and just ticked everything. Ticked everything. Ticked everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's purple tinted yeah. uh, lacquered wood in there and wow. all, all sorts of stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, the Shelby that you pointed out earlier is a really cool thing. Um, it's, you built, you, it's, it's a S-code big block Mustang that's been built up to a Shelby clone, but using all genuine Shelby parts and all documented. And the guy was working with Carol Shelby on it. And, there's a yeah, real nice provenance with that. And yeah, again, all the way down to the Z3 behind us, we, we, we want to keep it so yeah. it's still approachable and affordable for other people as well who just want something fun to smoke around in. And is all of this for sale? Or yeah. are there things that you're very reluctant to let go of? Um, what well, isn't for sale? I think there's a few things up here that have sold and are waiting to be dispatched, like the 964 and a couple of other bits. And uh, there's a few of my own, like the Ducati's mine and things like that. that Definitely not for sale. <laughs> um, but I was no. looking at that actually earlier. That's rather nice. Oh, thank you. I've wanted one since they came out. It's an MH900D that they made 2,000 of them. They, they, they go back to the online stuff actually. Ducati launched these online in 2001. You could only buy them through a lottery system on their website. And their website crashed three times in the first half an hour, uh, but they all sold out. Um, so they, you, know, you never see them really. They're, they're really cool bike. But I've wanted one since they were new and finally managed to pick one up last month. I've been searching high and low for the right thing. I didn't want a delivery mileage. Mm. One I wanted time. I could one actually, that you can use. Like we were saying yeah. about the Camaro earlier. Yeah. yeah, one that I can actually put some uh, put some more miles on. Yeah. So well, what are you seeing in terms? Because I mean that's an interesting point. So I mean that's you know we were talking about that earlier. Mileage is actually really important on a car, and you probably see this as well. Yes. People Stole buying. Stole my thunder. I was about. Sorry, to I'm sorry. Do in. you want to thunder in then? No. no, no, no. <laughs> okay. You'll do a much better job. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, do the people that you see are they really sort of looking to buy cars to use them, or are people? It's it's a tricky one. I think it really depends on the type of car it is. I mean that this GT3 that's uh, sat here. It's yeah, done 70 odd thousand miles, so it's not it's hardly a, a low mileage arm when it's being campaigned on track and everything else. But I think if you're of that mindset, you're buying a GT3 to use it, right? I mean, I, I, hate, I hate when people buy something like that and keep it in a box. If it's something that's perhaps a little bit more special, like your Camaro, that's original, low mileage and everything else, then it should be stashed away. Well, not stashed away, but yeah, it should yeah. be sort of you know, used for special occasions only kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's down to these days, kind of some people of, of this camp where if something's got, you know, we're sending out Yaris GRs with a thousand miles on it, and people are going, oh, I can't put any miles on that. So yes, Yaris. Yaris. Yeah. <laughs> They're still great. They're yeah. great I mean, cars. Still Yaris, yeah, yeah, yeah. Though, so. yeah. I mean, is that what you see as well? I mean, people are actually buying these cars to use, or are they buying them just to keep as investment I think, pieces? I think or? it's pretty much as, as Millen said, it depends on the, already prov the provenance of the car already yeah. and how it's already been used or not used. And uh, you know, if you're buying a car which has very low miles on it and is quite special, then potentially going to destroy yeah. the inherent value or the perceived value of the car by putting the miles on. So, yeah, I think we're seeing it's, it's just horses for courses. Of what what's already happened to the car? Yeah. What I think is quite tragic is that people are buying new cars, um, high performance cars that are quite you know special and should be used and literally yeah, keep it on delivery away. mileage yeah. away. people spend millions literally yeah. and they're just not even being used no, i, I can't see the point no. um, those aren't true enthusiasts no. they're just speculators yeah. just speculators investors and they can afford to buy these things and they take them away from people who are really going to appreciate and use cars i think yeah. that's quite sad no i, I agree from I, a funding I perspective I, I you know i'm very agnostic just like people to borrow money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So, so from that respect, as pure business finance company, I, I, I don't don't care. But from a personal perspective, yeah. I think it's quite tragic. Yeah, it's a waste, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're seeing a, a whole like a younger generation who, especially now with the ULEs coming in and things like that, who are buying ULEs exempt or compliant yeah. cars that are a bit quirky, just to daily drive them to get around because they're 2005 or whatever. It is no longer mm. compliant. So people are now leaning towards late 70s and early 80s stuff to, to really daily drive as well. So it's quite nice that there's still 
like a, a young blood of yeah, interest coming through the ranks. But mm. yeah, it's it's a shame to see stuff locked away. I think it's an yeah. interesting question actually. And um, if you've got any opinions, do let us know. Um, but going back to the um, young younger people coming through, sort of looking at that sort of late sixties, early seventies stuff. Yeah. Um, for which I consider myself one of them, of course. <laughs> um, do, I've always thought it's interesting because, you know, when I was really young, it was the sort of 50s stuff yeah. that people were, yeah. um, you know, sort of hankering after. Um, you know, I remember when a 275 GTB was, you know, like 150 grand. <laughs> um, that's sort of aging me slightly. But um, do you think it, that just moves on generationally? Yeah, I mean, the fact that you can go out and spend, you know, upwards of a million pounds on a skyline these days sort of blows my mind um so i think yeah it's, it really is sort of almost cyclical with with the generational thing so yeah, yeah i mean there's a lot of um hyperinflated stuff out there that using the gtrs again as an example at the moment um but with that i think it's just a sign of the times and i feel for cars like this triumph behind us 1949 triumph road it's a very pretty thing but sadly the, the audience for it is quite literally dying off yes. and i think yes. there's a, a big challenge ahead of people you know the vintage Bentley world is probably one of the only that's immune from it because it's still an accessible price point you know, mm. 200 to 500 thousand pounds accessible I use the term lightly but the rest of that era of stuff is really struggling with a with a kind of generational shift in interest and it doesn't really engage with people's interest either does no. it because yeah, they, yeah they, they well, I love find it, it hard to relate it's, to it's, yes. it's quite I think I'm quite you see in that. we asked a similar question of Tom Hartley Jr when we did a podcast with him uh, and I said well, who's who is buying the old vintage stuff pre Pre Second World War, yeah, uh, stuff because of the generation and um, his view is well, every good collector should <coughs> have, have something in their collection. Something in yeah, their collection. I, and I said yes, but that's like one or two yeah. of people who collect. Yeah, uh, you know, there's still a lot of this stuff that's around. That's yeah. No one's yeah, I think there's, a, a, there's an inherit, inherited interests as well. Yeah. So be it the car's been inherited by a family member, or it's you know, my grandfather had one of these, and my father had one of these. I think that. We're seeing that kind yeah. of tapering to an, yeah. an end, sadly. See, and again, that was from an investor's point of yeah. view. He was talking about yeah, yeah, rather than an enthusiast point yeah. of view. So if you're an enthusiast, you're highly unlikely to go out and buy a pre-war um, car. Yeah. I well, don't think so, anyway. No. But. Well, I mean, you tell us what uh, what your other half, what yeah, her motivation yeah. was. Because, what I mean... She, the, what, it's a rapier. And it's a, a Model A Speedster. Okay. Yeah, so George has got a 1929 Ford Model A Speedster. So it's like a boat tail wooden yeah. frame thing. It's really, really cool. Um, it yes, looks like a sort of 30s race car. It's built more recently, but it, yeah, on an original platform. Yeah. Um, and I think for her, it was she, she's massively into the vintage Bentley stuff. Um, she does a lot of work with uh, William Metcalf down at Vintage Bentley, and he's really making an effort to try and keep younger generation interested mm. in in the cars that he sells and restores because otherwise the customer base disappears um, and frankly the price point wasn't so accessible so georgia found this amazing boat tail thing um and it's been smoking around in it like it's a it's sort of a new range rover yeah. <laughs> so there's a question for you so there is a trend and you've got companies like lunas and yeah. they well uh who are converting um all the classic cars and vintage cars into uh, an electrifying put electric powertrains in uh, and then there's also the add-on of, with classic cars, do you keep them authentic and original as to how they're originally built, or do you bring them up to current day, of day standards, and put in parts that make yeah. them a, an easier and car to live with, car to live yeah. with and drive, yeah. and a bit of air conditioning maybe. Yeah. Um, or are you, are, you, are you a purist, or do you think maybe making vintage cars more usable? Yeah. That you're, might get interest yeah I think you're restricted heavily with certainly the pre and post war stuff because there's, there's so mm. many limitations as to what you could do to improve That's them true. where and also from a value and provenance perspective a lot yeah. of this stuff you know, you'd be crazy to modify them yeah whereas where like you know david lunas is sticking electric Correct. power plants in mass-produced range rovers yeah i i, I you know, I can see the appeal. I, I get why that works because they're, they're not really doing anything too sacrilege. Um, I mean, there's a guy who's done one to a Testarossa, and I think that's abhorrent. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah, I think it, it's really subjective based on the type of car mm. it is, but there's definitely a, a market for, like you say, these sort of retro, resto modded and you know, mm. retrofitted stuff. Um, I think just to kind of re engage a younger audience into the interest stuff. Okay. People love the idea of owning some of this classic stuff, but they just can't get their head the around actually using it. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, it is quite well, challenging. Well, yeah. yeah. 
the drive can be challenging. So, yeah. you know, you look cool, but actually it's not, sometimes it's just not the best well, drive. Well, I know in my Camaro, I just yeah. end up sweaty. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's no air con. Well, there you go. I said you need air con. I know. Yeah. I, well, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, one of the sort of end topics that we always ask our interviewees, um, we ask them three questions. What car would you race? What would you use as your daily driver? This is your ideal garage, of course. And what would you like to add to your collection? Now, it doesn't have to be race. It could just be campaign in some sort of event or I rally. Think, or... I think we're already in real inside your <laughs> <the> garage. <laughs> yeah. That's but, yeah, if, yeah. if, you, if yeah. money was no object in your ideal dream garage, what would your, the car you campaign, the car you use as your daily driver and the car you just look at? Yeah, I think for the campaign car, it's quite a simple one. I'd, I'd love a blower Bentley. Yeah, and it goes, it goes back oh, to this. Yes. I think that, that's for me, is like dream pinnacle thing. Uh, I, I, again, I, I think the Bentley, especially the blowers, are going to be immune from a value valuation mm. shift uh -huh. for many actually years. Quite, um, I would say quite a few. I see a few yeah. right. Bentley blowers in my time. Yeah, yeah they're, they're but again, in that fantastic. world, there's Bentley blowers and there's Bentley blowers. Yeah, yeah, so quite. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's, uh, there's uh, lots of nuances with quite. Them. Yeah, <laughs> this, this, but this is it. Going yeah. you know, back on you know, modifications and stuff. Something that's yeah, got yeah. provenance and has been used in, in periods like that would be the, the absolute dream. Mm -hmm. I think just for the I can sheer. See you with the goggles. On yeah. Yes. Yes. It, I think it's about as eccentric as it gets. and very, very it really British. Is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then in terms of days. I I've, so I bought a Testarossa last year and I kind of bought it for two or three months in my head, thought I'd get through summer and whatever else and decided not to sell it. And I've put you know, lots of miles on it, you know, sacrilege, but it's such a good car to use and I don't think I'll ever sell it. So that would, I'm very happy to keep that as the, and for me, it's still a pinch myself moment every time I see it and drive it and whatever else. I can't, I have massive imposter syndrome around that so car. Single mirror is a one. Uh, it's two. I did, I kind of wanted a, a single mirror and then, then drove one. <laughs> and thought, see where you were going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think also I could get my head around the shift in, you know, pay more, get less. I, yeah. I know you, obviously it's, a, it's yeah. a rare and more desirable thing, but yeah, I didn't want to spend another 30, 40,000 pounds on the I, same I just, car. That, that was, uh, I brought the wing mirror thing up before because in the height of the insanity of, you know, valuation bubbles, that's exactly what happens. People talk about, oh, a car with two wing mirrors worth less than yeah. one. Yeah. Um, because they're less produced. It's like, it's, has everyone lost their yeah, mind? Yeah, yeah. mind? Yeah, 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 I mean, you're yeah. talking about a wing mirror here. Yeah, I think, I know, it's it. like, it's, it's insane, it's, right? It's kind of cooler, but I, yeah. I think I was, uh, I couldn't get my head around just the value difference. No, yeah. I, I was it's quite right. happy to not spend a lot more money. You can always just cut one of them off. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. very much so. It's only got one wing mirror. <laughs> exactly, Yeah. purely original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. literally. Yeah. Um, Where were we? And then the last one, what would you add to your collection? I'd love a 275 Ford Cam. I think that would be my end game car. That would be like, yeah, the blower would be fun for you know, the old yeah. sort of champagne tour, but the, a 275 Ford Cam would be, yeah, yeah, that'd be it, just game over. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, other things and it's taken, it's, it's a, if you ask me next week, it'd be another car, but this week. <laughs> well, I have to say, you've chosen, I, first of all, I think I, I'm just so impressed well, there's no Porsches <laughs> in there. Well, that's exactly, why. exactly. Yeah. That there are no Porsches in there yeah. because everybody always <laughs> says a Porsche, and yeah. I think that's a really cop out um, answer, personally. Um, but secondly, I think you've gone for three really beautiful, very aesthetically pleasing, and different cars. Well, thank you. Well done, you. What can I say? Yeah, yeah you are definitely the first to choose a Bentley Blair, that's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Well, listen, Merlin, <laughs> thank you so much. Well, it's thank been you an both absolute for coming pleasure. Down. Thank and, you, Merlin. Um, so it's a pleasure. I'll have a quick look around. Yeah. Sure.